Welcome to Always Listening. We're your hosts. I'm Joel. I'm Jay. And we are always listening. Uh, back again, uh, Pod. How are you, sir? I'm doing just dandy. <laughs> We've got like a boatload of news to uh, get to today and uh, no specific follow up that needs to be discussed. So why don't we just dive right into it, actually, and start discussing some of these stories, because I want to get your reaction on all this stuff. First thing, let's talk about an article from Radio Public. We mentioned it last week, actually. We were going to try to get to it. Um, they have come out. This was on February 12th of this year. Uh, Jake Shapiro, which I is that relation to Julie? I've I've never heard of Jake before, but I've met Julie several times, which is behind the scenes at PRX, right? Probably. I don't I mean yeah. they've got to be some relation. Um anyway, um year one of paid listens. So they started this thing. I think they announced it at one of the podcast conferences last year. Hey, we've got paid listens coming. If you promote our platform, you tell your listeners to get onto our app, every listen that you get through us will guarantee what was it twenty dollars cpm i think is what they were guaranteeing uh in this particular article it says any podcast can enable paid listens and earn at a twenty dollars cpm for each listen in our apps yeah so you know that was the like banner feature is that the the companies like uh, Vox Nest and others that have audio boom that were doing dynamic ad insertion at different times and were promoting that as like, hey, no matter what level your show is, we can help you monetize right away. Nobody was hitting a $20 CPM. Nobody was definitely guaranteeing one, but nobody was even coming close to that, at least in the early goings. And you've talked about why. It was the issues with selling across such small little fiefdoms of the product as opposed to the whole podcast industry. Um, Radio Public, I, they had VC money is what they had mostly, but but theoretically they also had uh, an angle on a way to grow this over time and make it worthwhile. Okay, we're a year in. Jay, what has happened? There are now thousands of participating podcasters from all over the world in the program. We've paid out thousands of dollars. That's the exact quote. Thousands of dollars to podcasters who have reached the $25 threshold. Uh, So that means those podcasters have earned $25 off of a $20 CPM. So thousands of podcasters have earned thousands of dollars at $25 threshold. (laughs) They ain't making any money over there. And so when you mention like, obviously a lot of this is VC money, well, they're not paying out a lot of that VC money either. Just in comparison in 2018, Vox Nest, which I must admit, I am a former employee of, uh, 2,400 podcasters as part of the Prime program were paid $1 million. That's an exact quote with an exact figure. 2,400 podcasters made $1 million in 2018 using the ad insertion program at VoxNest, which is the parent company to Spreaker and Blog Talk Radio. That is a lot more than thousands of podcasters who made thousands of dollars. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, you and I were not very high on this when it came out. Uh, we weren't discussing it here on the show, but privately you and I talked about it several times. And, and Elsie, Elsie Escobar with Libsyn, she does a great job every time that one of these new companies comes in and says, we've got a new app and we want all the creators to come over here because we're going to help you monetize your show. She says, yeah, but what are you going to do for the listeners, right? Like until you have a listener first experience, there is no reason whatsoever that you're going to build up a critical mass. Uh, People will do a lot to support their creators, but for creators – there's no reason to use that juice that you have with your audience to build someone else's platform versus taking it straight to your website versus taking it to your Patreon where you're developing direct support. Uh, I mean, it, there is a middleman there, but at least you are maintaining the relationship in that case. You know, you've got direct contact, you've got email addresses and things that you can maintain that relationship even if Patreon rises and falls. You go to to Radio Public and this experiment doesn't work, well, then all you've done is build their failing platform for them to sell it it off to somebody or something, you know, like, uh, it's – 
Yeah, he, yeah, for instance. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, so this is a big pass for me on Radio Public. Anytime somebody says, should I be over on that app, I don't even suggest you bother with submission. I really don't. That's not one of the ones that I'm worried about being in at all. Well, and it gets, just goes I, – I just wanted to highlight this particular article because it was sent out as sort of big news. This is great news, phenomenal news for podcasters, but understand – there isn't there aren't exact dollar amounts mentioned there isn't even an exact number of podcasters and thousands that word thousands literally can mean 1001 podcasters 1001 dollars could be that's all it need, needs to be to qualify to be defined as thousands well so and it very specifically doesn't sound to me like 99,000, right? You would say, you wouldn't no. say thousands. You would say tens of thousands or, you know, nearly a hundred thousand dollars in revenue if that's what you were going to say even. But like, that's not what they said. <laughs> I'm actually surprised that this even got picked up as it, as like, as a journalist. If I'm reading this in and I'm being frank with myself and with how I'm presenting this to my readers, why would I even choose this as an article to present to them? just sort of as a basis of fact without giving any sort of context to it and understanding that this is obviously meant to hype up their platform, but at the end of the day, it doesn't hype up anything. It actually highlights how poor they're actually doing. So that's something I, I, I want people to understand when they read articles that get released by this, that when press releases are sent out, look for the details and follow the money. And that's, and you know, I mentioned Vox Nest before, and I may or may not have certain feelings about that particular company, but understand that there were very specific numbers released when they released theirs and didn't get half as much hype as this particular article got from Radio Public, and they actually made podcasters money versus Radio Public. Huh. Yeah, and and that's what it's about. Like, I, I, I've heard the skepticism. Uh, I mentioned Elsie earlier. I mentioned her co-host on the feed, Rob Walsh. Rob Walsh is always so skeptical and and negative on ad insertion. He talked, you're never going to make any money at all, et cetera, et cetera. There is money being made for small time podcasters, for mid level podcasters, for large podcasters. There is money being made. However, there are a lot of companies that are offering and promising smoke and mirrors and they're not delivering really anything or very little at all. And we need to make sure to point out the difference between those two. There, there is a path through dynamic ad insertion to something stable for normal everyday podcasters to either turn off the fees associated with podcasting or minimize them uh, all or, or almost all, uh, or even make a little money as a hobby. But there are also companies that are looking to just build a platform and use you as raw numbers and they'll run you through the meat grinder and that will be the end of your association with them. I want people to sort of understand as I have a full background in how podcasts are making money at this particular point in time, there is a number and that number is 10,000, 10,000 downloads for your, for your podcast per episode. How do you get that number? Usually they're looking at your first 24 to 48 hours of release. If you're hitting 10,000 downloads within that particular time period, and those would of course be IAB certified numbers, then you are, uh, you are in that stratosphere of being able to qualify for those host read ads that come with a $25 CPM on average. If you are below that number, even if you are in the nine thousands, you are, sort of knocking at the door and you might get one or two. Um, but companies are very hesitant to go lower than that particular number. Uh, if you are in like the 3000 range, for instance, depending on your niche, you might actually do quite well. But again, if you have a niche, like a, a perfect example is in the geek. He's got a phenomenal niche with his horse network, right? He's dealing with a very specific type of audience. Because of that, he can actually make a lot more money with a podcast that might only get 1,000 to 2,000 listens because of how targeted that particular audience is for that particular niche. 
Uh, similarly, if you have a podcast that has a niche like that, you're going to do better working on your own to get advertisers to work with you in that particular audience type than you will working with uh, a mid-roll company, a Voxness company, a Podbean, et cetera, any of these other companies that are offering advertising because those companies are working at, the word I despise, scale. They're looking to work with a very general audience. They're not looking to work with a niche audience. They don't have the manpower to work with niche audiences. Mm. Uh, all right. Speaking of niche audiences versus big audiences, let, let's go ahead and move over to the uh, next article that we wanted to talk about. This one is from uh, Tom Webster, How Big Should Podcasting Be? Uh, and uh, he's really discussing a, a share of ear analysis, um, which is interesting because the share of ear is about to come out for this year. It's interesting that he wrote this article looking back at last year's. I don't know. I guess he's teasing the fact that he's going to be around and evaluating this one too. Um, the short answer is he says podcasting's not as big as it should be money wise anyway. Right. So he mentions, uh, from that chair of ear that podcasting results in 4% of everything that goes into people's ears. Um, that's compared to radio, television, personal music, streaming music, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's 4%. However, he mentions that if you take out, uh, some of the things that, um, uh, why don't I just directly quote, uh, the genius Tom Webster as I'm totally murdering the way that he <laughs> describes this. Uh, here's what all of it means. If we take out all of the non-addressable audio platforms, remove the 11% of our total audio consumption that is basically listening to music videos on YouTube because they don't sell audio ads, and the listening to the premium ad versions of Pandora, Spotify, etc., we're left with AM, FM radio, ad-supported streaming audio, and podcasting, and that's 64% of our total audio consumption. Podcasting might be 4% of that total audio consumption, but it's 6% of our addressable audio consumption. Yeah. You, you can't buy ads in my audio book. You can't buy ads in my Sirius XM music radio, et cetera, right. et cetera. Or my, when I'm playing CDs, when I'm playing, you know, Apple music, whatever, you can't get into that as an advertiser. So if we take the total addressable audio market at a very conservative $20 billion in 2018, that means podcasting should, that's in quotes, already be pulling in 1.2 billion of that. And I can tell you right now, the podcasting space is not making $1.2 billion well, at this particular point in time. It's not even estimated to do that. Like the number by 2020 no. is they're shooting for like 690 million, right? Like it's just under right. 690 million. Right. Now he says he thinks it's going to catch up soon, but he wrote about the Spotify purchase of anchor and Gimlet and the ramifications of that transaction and there's been a lot of people that have said that uh, they have overpaid uh, specifically for Anchor. Uh, but considering the way that he just laid out the actual economics of audio, of the audio space here, he his thing at the end is it's possible that they bought low on those particular platforms because there is that that ceiling of $1.2 billion, which podcasting isn't even close to yet. Uh, if you look at it in that sense, it, he makes a very salient point. Well, so one of the things that you and I sort of skirted a bit in a previous episode is whether or not the anchor purchase for Spotify adds that much technology wise for ad insertion and for ad targeting, right? Because Spotify obviously has this already. They've been doing this for music. Uh, and, and been fairly successful at it too, because they've continued to grow their, their free, uh, service for people. And they wouldn't do that if it wasn't making them money. So, um, the question was behind, behind the scenes, how much actual integration is there going to be? How much were they gaining on that targeting side of things and the dynamic insertion for the actual purchase from Anchor? But 
I, I mean, I, to me, that would be the answer to, to his question of whether they bought low or high. If they're not gaining much on that side of things, then Spotify could go ahead and reap this benefit without the anchor purchase as the audio space and podcasting specifically grows, right? Well, here it is, Joel. I mentioned the the money tree, and you talked about how I'll give that number when the next share of ear. Because I mentioned it with Apple, because Apple has publicly released the total number of podcasts on their platform, at least you can find it, and the total number of downloads they had in 2018. Imagine if there was another company, though, that turned on the money tree. They may not have every podcast yet, but they might and ultimately end up getting every podcast available on their platform. And yes, they may already have the targeting technology on their platform, but Let's say you wanted to do more than just the beginning and the end of a podcast. You wanted to put ads in the middle, which are much more valuable than the ads at the beginning or the end, because you can obviously skip the ads at the beginning, and you could never listen to the ads at the end of a podcast. But what if you put the ads in the middle of the podcast, where people are, you know, we know that 85% of people that listen to podcasts on a regular basis listen to all or most of a podcast. We also make assumptions based on their listening habits. We've seen the consumption data from Apple. While it is very limited, we have seen that uh, what we've seen from Apple backs up that information that we've seen from Edison Research on the listening habits of podcasting. You can also look at what people are doing when they're listening to a podcast. They're usually working out, they're driving, they're doing household chores, they're doing something else that would prevent them in the middle of a podcast, say, to pull the device back out of their pocket to hit the skip button a couple times to get over that particular ad. Let's say there was a company that did that. How would you make it available for the creator, who's the owner of the show, to put that ad somewhere in the middle of their content with their consent? Who do they? I don't think Spotify Spotify didn't have that technology before, but It appears they might have that technology now, and having been a member of a team that got merged, I have a feeling it's going to take them about a year or so to get their technologies to sort of talk to each other and figure it out. But when they do, Spotify would then have a platform where the content creator can upload their content to the Spotify platform and choose where they're going to have the ads inserted into their podcast. And Spotify will then have some sort of revenue share, you would assume, you would hope for. But this is what I've been warning people about. And that is, look at the revenue deals Spotify has struck with the musicians on their platform. It's going to be less than what you're accustomed to in the podcasting space. And maybe it won't. Maybe Spotify will change that. Maybe Spotify will will do what has been the industry standard with most people and their revenue shares with a 60-40 split and 60% going to the content creator. But be careful. That's I would just say that that's all I will say about that is just sort of watch. We're about a year, I think we're about a year away from Spotify turning on the money tree. I think you're right, uh, which is why I actually, it's funny enough, Jay, I had a, um, I had a client this week who had moved to anchor, moved her show to anchor a new client specifically because of the monetization that they were offering. And she wanted to take advantage of some of those sponsor dollars that they were throwing around. Uh, Dave Jackson was talking about it and she had made a little bit of money, uh, from, from anchor, uh, but it was just basically like, Dave Jackson had mentioned where there's a lot of anchor ads that you're you're running, for instance, you know, like she's got an ad for anchor in her show and they were paying her for it. But at the same time, like that's not real money, right? Like you're not, that's not sustainable. And I, I agreed with her. I said, and the other thing is you should know now that Spotify has purchased them, that will dry up very quickly as they shift gears to whatever they're going to do. Now in a year or 18 months or two years, they'll have a new plan and you might be making as much or if not more money than you were today. But if, if you're already not, if it's not a gold rush today and it wasn't for her, 
then the the shifting sands of things means you ought to get on a stable platform wherever that is, at least in the short term, you know. And so she's moving back to uh, the host that she was using previously. But um, I, I don't know. We live in interesting times. My question is, can Apple do this? faster you and i talked about it's literally just a a switch they would need to flip is that all it would take do they have the technology in place to just make this happen overnight or would they also be a nine month 12 month roadmap no they have they have to either build the technology or acquire the technology that already exists and my guess is uh when it comes to spotify Anchor was cheaper than some of the other options that are out there because we've mentioned mentioned Voxnest a couple of times. Uh, Podbean has this technology. Uh, Blueberry has developed this technology. Uh, Libsyn has claimed to have this technology for quite some time. And we and when we talked about the acquisition of Anchor, we talked about how Libsyn's number one, Blueberry's number two, Voxnest is number three, Podbean's right up there. So these companies were obvi- have a much higher price tag than what Spotify purchased Anchor at. And I think that might be exactly what <laughs> Mr. Webster here is referring to, that they bought low and got the technology they needed to make it possible for the money tree to be really effective. You Listen, when I do give the, the dollar signs on Apple, it will be based just on pre, pre-rolls and post-rolls because – there isn't the ability to put the mid rolls in, but once you add one mid, think about this. Just just think in the pure math sense, without any dollar signs ahead of it, you're going to make a certain amount with a pre roll and a post roll. If you're Apple and you have six hundred and twenty thousand podcasts and you add one ad, one more ad to that number, and you're monetizing it over six hundred and twenty thousand, that's, I mean, just at a dollar. Think about how much money you just made. So that's the that's where the gold is. And of course, I've only been saying it for years. I've got I've got data on twenty four hundred podcasts <laughs> where multiple ads don't turn off an audience. I know that there are giants in the industry that will ream you for the number of ads that you put in a podcast, and will you know, put the absolute scare in you about how it's going to turn off your audience. Nobody wants to recreate what's happening on terrestrial radio. That's there's a reason people are leaving terrestrial radio, but at the same time, if you are interested in making money in this and you're doing it in an ad supported way, there's a way to really make money off of it. And there's a way to make money them more than just the ads. Remember, I've always said it's, it's never one way to make money off your podcast. The best way to maximize your total revenues is provide your audience with an ad version of your podcast and an ad free version of your podcast. I hope you people are taking notes right now because this is really a beauty here. If you gave your audience a version of your podcast, they can download for free whenever they want, but it's going to be, it's going to have ads in it. It's like, listen, I got to make money from this. I'm putting in, you know, three, four hours of hard work and labor into this one episode every week so that I can entertain, educate, and give you some sort of emotional response every single week. That's great. If, if you, if you don't find any value in that to pay me directly through a Patreon, well, I need to make money from it somehow. And that's going to be with the ads. And a large majority of your audience is going to be fine with that. There's going to be another portion of your audience. that's going to be like, I don't want ads. Okay. Well, I'll provide you an ad free version, uh, over here on Patreon. You're going to have to pay me though, some dollar amount per month that I can rec, I can justify giving you an ad free version. And now you're, maximizing your revenues as a podcast content creator and you're giving the audience exactly what they want how they want it if they can't afford to pay you what you feel your podcast is truly worth then at least they're still going to get your content they're just going to have to deal with what advertisers feel your content is worth uh yeah uh, we did it once upon a time with always listening 
uh, when we were when Josh and I were together and we were doing regular interviews. We had uh, why are we doing that now, Joel? Ad supported. <laughs> well, well, we might get there eventually. We 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 just started back with a new format. We're re we reestablishing our audience a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, we did we had the ad supported obviously through uh, Blog Talk Radio and and now uh, Spreaker. We host with uh, Vox Nest and Spreaker, and then uh, we had a Patreon that we were running and for. Yeah, I think we had it just at the dollar level. If you were given a dollar a month or more, maybe it was $3 a month, whatever it was. If you turned on the Patreon, you could get the, the um, RSS feed from there, and it was you know all ad-free, uh, direct through the, the Patreon feed. Um, and I mean, look, if you're the kind of person who likes to find things that fall off the back of trucks and you don't want to pay for things – the Patreon feeds aren't that secure. There are ways out there. There are lots of places on the internet. You can go get a hacked copy of Marin's feed or of Rogan's feed or whatever, I'm sure. Um, and you could do the same on, on these smaller shows too. But the vast majority of your audience isn't going to want to do that. Either they will say, I'll just take it for free with ads and I'll skip them if they bother me that much. Or I'll throw them a buck or two or $3 a month or $5 a month or whatever it is. And I'll, I'll support them directly. And that way I won't have to listen to his Casper ad. <laughs> uh casper's soft though jay you should you should buy a, a new mattress um I, mm. I you know i don't know why i'm shilling for them i don't even have a i don't have a casper mattress i i'm i'm a podcast listener from back in the day i have a tuft and needle mattress uh they were oh, a my. much they were a much smaller company they didn't hit like casper and i think they're actually owned now by one of the big mattress companies i think they got bought out they're like a boutique brand for one of the big mattress companies Jay, let's quickly because we're we're going to run out of time here. Let's get to Chartable. You want to talk about that uh, that article first? Why don't you uh, Why don't you bring up what you wanted to talk about? There? Okay, I, I would I would like to discuss this a little bit. Uh, I want to say first of all a quick congratulations to uh, our good buddy Jonathan Oaks. We've mentioned him before, and the whole Trivial Warfare crew: Carmela, uh, Chris, uh, Carmela Smith, Chris Hollister, and uh, Benjamin Young. All four of them have been nominated for the Trivia Hall of Fame, which is a, a huge honor. Obviously, they've been podcasting now. I think they're in their fourth year heading into the fifth, maybe. Uh, it's at least been three and change. I think it's been four and change now. But they have really built a thriving community. Uh, Jonathan has recently shifted his business model a little bit. He's he's gone to a more heavy Patreon uh, support. He's trying to make this thing his full time gig uh, and and grow the amount of trivia they're able to produce. The community I hope he was just taking notes. <laughs> yeah, he I know, be right? Taking notes on what I just suggested. The the community is the is the thing that blows my mind because if you look, there are so many people that have listened to his show, connected with others, and then started shows of their own. There are a bunch of podcasts that are effectively Jonathan's pod children because they would never have even thought of, of the impetus to do this if he hadn't started what he did. Anyway, they are being recognized. Whether they actually make it into the Hall of Fame or not, the voting's going on right now. Though, as a matter of fact, we should put a link in the show notes. I'll try to make that happen, as a matter of fact. Um, I'll find that link so you can vote for him. Uh, but whether they make it into the Hall of Fame or not, being recognized among the other nominees, there's only six nominees, I think, every year. Uh, so it's a limited number that are even put up for this. It shows the level of impact they've had in their specific space. Something interesting that coincided with this earlier this week, I was talking to a paranormal podcaster, a guy by the name of Jim Harold. Great guy. He's been in this thing since like 2005. He's a pioneer, you know, like you, Pod. And uh, he says in the paranormal space, he's very well known. Folks know who he is. They know his name. They know his brand. They know what he's doing. Uh, they respect his contribution to the space. In the podcasting space, he's sort of an unknown, even though he's been around since 2005. And I see, Jay, so many people, friends of ours, that chase acceptance, acknowledgement, approval in the podcasting space, which is great. I love it. I love being in this space. I love my friends in the space. I love that people know my name and know my face and know my shows. That's wonderful. I love that I get to know people like you that I look up to as mentors and, and sort of heroes in the industry. But for most of us, podcasting is not your focus. That's not your niche. That is the medium through which you are primarily getting out your message and building your community. But that's not what you're about. Now, for me, that is actually what I'm about. Podcasting is my space. 
But if you're a trivia podcaster, if you're a sports podcaster, if you're podcasting about your city or your geographic region, you don't need, I think, to waste time or distract yourself focusing your energies in feeding the podcast industry. You need to focus on building your community and your niche. Build out into the areas of people that are interested in what you're talking about, but that don't know they like podcasts yet. That's your audience, right? That's the people that you should be chasing. And when you do, things like this happen. That's what Jonathan's been doing. Jonathan has worked in the podcast space. He's spoken at podcast conferences. He shared a lot of his knowledge for building the his Patreon community especially. That's been helpful for a lot of people I know. But that's never his focus. His focus is trivia conferences and trivia conventions and trivia events and, uh, you know, eking into the Jeopardy community. That was a big move for him. He worked around all the edges and got himself into the Jeopardy community, and that has paid dividends. They listen to the show. They promote the show. But also, they come on the show, and now he's got celebrity guests, you know, among that space anyway. So – If you want to grow your show, if you want to make an impact, if you want your community to love you, if you want to have a legacy with your podcast, unless your show is always listening, podcast news or podcast reviews, then you probably shouldn't be chasing podcast influencers. You should be chasing people in your space. You should be focusing in your own niche or in, uh, interest. That That is such a lesson, and it's something that I think a lot of podcasters overlook or, or uh, you know, get distracted on. I think that's uh, well said. And, uh, you know, I've always been a big fan of Jonathan's. I've been a big fan of Trivial Warfare from the beginning. I mean, when he first introduced himself to me by... I don't even remember. I think it was at a new media expo, uh, you know, and he had like 50 listeners to his show, you know, and now seeing where he's come and how far he's come. Uh, it's phenomenal. It's a great story. It's one that uh, we all aspire to, even those who uh, may be considered heroes or pioneers in their, uh, in their specific niche. Um, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, should be looked on. And I think the advice of staying in your lane is, uh, is very good because eventually when you get to the top of your lane, uh, you're going to be recognized in other lanes. And that's, you know, if, if you just stay focused on what you're doing and whom you're trying to get that message to, you're going to be much better off for it. Speaking of which, uh, uh, I'm going to get out of my lane and become a podcast critic here, Joel, because, uh, this week, um, instead of us giving a recommendation, we decided to do a review of a podcast. And this came up in our discussions in a previous episode about the Ron Burgundy show. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to do mine first because it's briefer and I think you've got some more in depth things to say. <laughs> um, I, here, here's my short overview. I, first of all, I didn't expect much going into it. I will say the production is, is very nice. It's, uh, it's got an interesting sound to it. I heard Dave Jackson complaining on the, uh, podcasters roundtable this week about the fact that his co-host, the, um, the producer on the show is always speaking off mic. They don't, they don't put her fully on mic. They make it sound as if she's sort of removed. I, that's on purpose, but I do dislike it as well. I, as much as she talks in some episodes, they ought to get her centered. Um, but it is very well done. They've clearly got a team of writers and the character of Ron Burgundy is just as you remembered him from the Anchorman films. Uh, it's interesting to see him play in the audio space or I say to hear him play in the audio space, I guess I should say, uh, The thing that occurs to me, though, Jay, is the the real question for this show is, will it bring new listeners to podcasting? Because if it doesn't, it's not going to make iHeartRadio $12 million, which is what they're paying him supposedly, right? If it's not bringing new listeners, it's not going to make the money back. Okay. I don't – I wonder how many it's going to bring. They are promoting it heavily, and it's a very mainstream product, uh, uh, you know, a a mainstream um, idea uh, or show that that – character is very mainstream he had big success in both films okay so that might bring in some some new listeners my concern is <laughs> without the visual i think his comedy is not going to reach that mainstream potential listener 
if they're not already into the podcasting thing. So like so many of his jokes work well for me because I'm used to the tropes that he's making fun of now. And if you're not into podcasting and you can't see him being goofy, I think some of this stuff's going to fly wide. And I, I don't think this is going to be a success long term. That, that's my overall take. It's interesting. I'm not going to continue listening very likely. Uh, how many episodes did you listen to? Uh, all three that were available. I, I, as a matter of fact, I re-listened okay. to the part of the Christmas, um, Christmas memories episode. Uh, let's talk about a subject that's evergreen. Christmas, you can talk about it anytime. Yeah, uh, I thought that uh, that whole bit was pretty funny. But other than that, like I, yeah, just overall, it was not. I just, I don't think this is going to hit that like. I, I don't know. I know a couple of bros that yeah. like sports talk radio and that love Ron Burgundy. I don't think they're going to enjoy this podcast. Well, and that's sort of that's sort of what I wanted to get into as in being doing a very critical review of this particular podcast. And that's we we just talked about you know know your lane, know your audience, and the Ron Burgundy podcast. So Ron Burgundy as a character appeals to whom? appeals to the millennial male. We're looking at the 18 to 24 year old male listener. The concepts of the comedy, Deepak Chopra, uh, and, and some of the other memes uh, in the true crime podcasting realm appeal to whom? Appeal to the NPR listener who is older, wiser, and would look down upon the 18 year old humor that Ron Burgundy brings. It's, you know, I, I mentioned it before going into the podcast. I was a big fan of the Colbert rapport, uh, when Stephen Colbert doing the character on comedy central and the satire that he was delivering, uh, as over the top as it was, had a subtlety to it. There is no subtlety with the Ron Burgundy character. It's hits you over the head. This man is stupid and a misogynist. Uh, and and there's no redeeming quality to him whatsoever. And, and the way that he treats his producer is downright despicable. And in that first episode, the true crime episode, with all the tropes and the memes that he's hitting on and the jokes about podcasting and how it's not radio, it's 2019. Like those jokes have already been done and said and worn out. And honestly, if it was a real podcast, not a satire of a podcast, all of that stuff would have been edited out. <laughs> it wouldn't have never would have made the air. So to me, it's, I, I think they're trying to do too much. The comedy is delivered to an audience. That's not going to hit on the concepts that they're trying to deliver. And that's obviously something that can be fixed. You mentioned that there's a team of writers. It's the funny or die team. That's uh, producing this along with uh, iHeartRadio. radio, uh, so there's things that they can that they can try, but y- you listen to Christmas memories and re-listen to because of the way that I felt about the show after listening to the first two. I did not listen to Christmas memories because I was like, "Why are you releasing a like? No, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to listen to Christmas jokes uh, in spring. I don't. It's not even spring yet. It's only in February. But still, I, I just I was like, "Nope, I've had enough." So I, I'm already. I've always wanted to say this, Joel. It's it's been my lifelong dream to be on this particular podcast, always listening and say zero earbuds. <laughs> uh it's been a long time since we did earbuds. Um I so I will say this. I really enjoyed the Deepak Chopra bit. But again, I'm not the Ron Burgundy listener right like i'm not yeah, 18 to 24 year old male doesn't even know who deepak chopra is yeah that's what i'm saying like and they definitely don't want to like i took a lot away from what he had to say because he had things to say about life and death and and the way that we wrap our mind around existence which is something that i think about but the guy that wants to listen to ron burgundy i don't again it's not this these audiences these venn diagrams don't cross over i will say this Good scam for Will Ferrell, right? Like, what a good good job, Will. <laughs> Dude, absolutely. I will never, I will never disparage a man for making a dollar. Well, never, and not just Any making man. a dollar, but clearly making some weird crap that he wants to make. Right? Like, it's it. This is clearly a thing that he's enjoying doing. 
You know, you could hear that, I think, in his performance. Uh, I would enjoy it too for $12 million. I'd enjoy lots of things for $12 million. But, but my point is like, um, yeah, he's out there making weird art and he got a gigantic corporation to pay for it. That's kind of cool, all on its own, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, the Ron Burgundy character is, is of course, what every male wants to be stupid, uh, disparaging women, and, um, you know, not have any sort of self awareness. It's, it's like, it's, it, he is the, he is the dream male. Like, if, if a man could be a man, that's what a man would be. Send all those comments oh, by to, the way, to Pod Vader. To, oh, I'm just. I'm not saying that's what I want to be, and that's not how I act, clearly. But uh, that's how Ron Burgundy acts. It's ridiculous. Anyway. It is, it is, uh, it's on iHeartRadio, but it's not, I was surprised it's not an iHeartRadio exclusive, right? Like, it's everywhere, and they're not, it doesn't even seem to be in a yeah. window. They're releasing it just wide on the RSS feed. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I guess. I listened via Apple. Yeah, I listened I on Overcast, I, actually. I, I still listen. Yeah, I, li- I still listen on an iPod. I don't have it in here with me, but yeah, I'm still old school that way. I downloaded my iPod. You and Steve Stewart, you're the only two left. That's the only two functioning iPods in the world, I think. Uh, all right, uh, Jay, we got to run because you and I both got some appointments to get to, but we appreciate all of our listeners. We appreciate everybody checking out this week's episode. You can go to our website, always listeningpod.com anytime for more. And we'll be back next week with more podcasting news. Until then, we've been your hosts. I'm Joel. I'm Jay at the Real Pod Vader on Twitter, Facebook.com slash Pod Vader page. It's perfect. And we are always listening. Yeah, I know I ain't seen it all, but I've seen enough. Yeah, I know I ain't seen it at all, but I've seen enough. Always Listening is a proud member of the Two Guys and a Rogue Network. You can find all our reviews by searching Always Listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher Radio. Also, you can find us anytime at alwayslisteningpod.com or email us at alwayslisteningpod at gmail.com. Our theme song is Enough by Bethany Rayburn. Two guys and a rogue. I'm one guy. I'm the other. And this is The Network.